Hey everybody, it is Coleman Crawley, and if you don't know me by that name, maybe you know me by Sharp Shot Selections. If you don't know me by either of those names, perhaps you've seen my face, or my yelling at least, pop up on your For You page, on your Twitter feed. Maybe I've annoyed you like I've annoyed Nadu, but I am the kid that's trying to find Cinderella before she's at the ball. I'm going to a new, smaller mid-major game every single day, recording content from that game, placing a bet on who I think will cover. Lately, I've just been placing losers. It's not even been a bet, just losers. I'm hoping to change that soon, but given that we're halfway through, we're about to enter February. Today is Tuesday when I'm recording this, January 31st. We're about halfway through the conference regular season. I thought I'd provide an update on what I've seen to this point, give a recap of what I've seen so far. Probably should have done this far sooner. So today will be a run-through of my top Cinderella candidates. Um, that's been the goal for this journey to find Cinderella. Top individual performances, who have been the best individual players that I've seen have a great game. Not just guys like Antoine Davis or Imani Bates who struggled when I saw them that are terrific players, right? But the guys that had exceptional individual performances the night that I saw them. Go through favorite coaches, favorite and worst venues, bad beats or crazy wins. All of that will be discussed and then I'll conclude with my future plans and how things might change just slightly with what I'm doing going forward. But before all that, I wanted to provide the agenda, but before all that, why I went on this journey, my background, some of you asked, how are you affording this, um, and what this journey is about. So the goal is to find Cinderella before she's at the ball. I'll explain a little bit more in detail later. But it's the St. Peter's of the world, the ORUs, the Loyola Chicago's. If you go further back, the VCU's, the George Mason's, even a Steph Curry at Davidson, right? We have these teams that, frankly, we don't care about, the majority of the college basketball public or sports viewing public, for four or five months of their season, four months of their season, then all of a sudden, mid-March, they win a couple games and we start paying attention, right? I want to be on these teams in January and February before they make that big run. To go even further back to the beginning, why I've fallen in love with college basketball, why I'm wanting to pursue this. I, I think I'd have to go back to when I'm five years old. Um, my dad, it was his last year of coaching high school basketball. He had a team that was 500 that year, went 11-11 in the regular season and in Oklahoma. Similar to um, a lot of these teams, you know, having chances in their conference tournament. It doesn't matter what your record is you could still make the big dance, the state tournament, double elimination playoff to get there. Well, they upset two top five teams on their way, winning four straight games, make the state tournament. And it just gave me a naive belief that with hard work, anything is possible. As a five-year-old and probably set my mindset, you know, for 20 years down the road, here I am, 26. Um, on top of that, OU, 2002, Kelvin Sampson's team, had Hollis Price, Abby Ara, Quanis White. They were unbelievable. Made a run to the Final Four. So my favorite team, the team I've grown up loving, you know, kind of primarily early on for football, but with basketball having unbelievable success that exact same year, just a couple weeks later after my dad's run, again, just gave me that naive belief that anything is possible. And holy cow, I love this game. It is so much fun. It made me to where I put in a ridiculous amount of work on my game, thought that from that work, I'm going to be able to go D1. I'm go Even if I'm a preferred walk-on, something like that, I'm going to be a D1 college basketball player. Turns out you need a little bit more than hard work, um, need to have a little bit of athleticism, of which I have very little, and it held me back from going D1. I ended up playing golf and then just going to OU for school uh, after a little junior college golf. I thought if I went D1 in college basketball, I could parlay, parlay that into a job, whether that be eventually becoming a college basketball coach, I love the game so much, dissecting the ins and outs, the X's and O's, or covering college basketball as an analyst, play-by-play -play guy, color commentator, something like that. I wanted my career to be involved with college basketball, but then when I don't get a D1 job, or excuse me, a D1 scholarship, I majored in business, went the business route, um, majored in finance and accounting, I guess I should say, and pursued sales. Went in sales for three and a half years. If you go back two years, 
COVID hits, allowed me time to think and dream. As a college kid, I had made a um, bracketology account to try and be like Joe Lunardi, um, predict the 68 teams that are going to be in the field where they're going to be seeded. Well, 2020, COVID hits. We don't get an NCAA tournament. I'm like, all this bracketology work I've been doing all years for nothing, for absolutely nothing. The committee's not even going to post, you know, what 68 they would have had in the field had the season stopped today. So I was like, screw that. I've done all this work. I'm going to put something good into it. I decided to record about a two hour selection show, acting as if I was the committee and also simultaneously being Greg Gumbel, Seth Davis, those guys, Doug Gottlieb, picking the field and then picking who I think would win based on my 68 teams in the field. Spoiler, I had Michigan State as a four seed that year. Probably wouldn't happen. It's the Big Ten. It's the Big Ten. I was naive back then. I now know what the Big Ten does. They fail in March. I digress. I decided to post that podcast or recording on YouTube, whatever, and got some incredibly nice responses in my Twitter DMs and from other friends that this is something I should look at pursuing, that this is something I obviously have a passion in and somewhat of a talent for. From there, I then turned my Twitter account into not just a bracketology Twitter account, but I'm going to try to be a college basketball analyst. I'm going to make a podcast, start recording you know, some stuff from a podcast, show that I can speak knowledgeably on the game. I'm going to start picking games um, against the spread, see if I can have success as a handicapper, just try a variety of things to make it on this space or in this space, in this landscape. I then quickly realized I'm not gonna be able to half-ass two things and have a ton of success in either. I'm 26 years old. Um, I knew I'd had a good sales year and was going to get a decent amount of commission at the end of the year that I can use that commission to then supply my dream for at least the last couple months of the conference basketball regular season before I go dead broke and then have to get a job. And that I was simply going to bet on myself that someone would see the passion, the dedication, the knowledge for the game, just the grind, the relentlessness and someone would want to hire me to do this or something similar to this in a full-time capacity. Maybe that's naive and I'll simply, you know, be working odd in jobs from April through December and then starting this in late December every single year. But I love this game so much. I love the unpredictability of it. I love the beauty within it. And I want to cover it in some capacity for a living, so that's been the goal. So when I quickly realized I wasn't gonna be able to half-ass two things, I decided, all right, I'm 26, I can make this leap again with this commission and just see what happens, right? So I started deep diving into some research, looking at, okay, what would I do that would be special or unique to cover this sport? I looked up the average attendance of every single D1 team and I was stunned by how many teams, particularly in the Northeast, that averaged less than 1,000 people per game in attendance. And now some of these attendance numbers are probably exaggerated by season ticket holders or things like that. So even less people are at the games than the attendance numbers that are being shown. So specifically when I kept scrolling and I find a St. Peter's who made the Elite Eight, averaged 526 people at their home games, yet Syracuse was fourth in the country in average attendance at 17,000, didn't even make the NCAA tournament. I was like, there is a problem here. Mid and small major college basketball is not being covered well enough, not getting the exposure that it needs for the talent that is on display. You look at these teams that are able to make runs and it's happened much more often. You look at how long it took a 15 seed to win multiple games until Dunk City and Florida Gulf Coast did it. Now we've got three teams that have done it. I think the transfer portal um, and the unpredictability that that creates within college basketball, teams that do have continuity are rewarded even more We're going to see more chaos like this in the NCAA tournament, and I want to be on these teams in January and February. And when I saw how low the attendance numbers were, it made me think, okay, I can get behind the bench or goal at these games 
get very good footage or the best footage I can from an iPhone of this high level of basketball being played, show excitement for it, and maybe generate or attract more of an audience, more attention to it, as these kids so greatly deserve. I'll, I'll get into a little bit more in depth as we go further. But Colgate, I'm not kidding. This is a team that has made consecutive NCAA tournaments. Colgate was baffled to have someone standing up cheering the entire game, knowing all of their names. And this is one of the best teams in college basketball, I'm telling you, especially from an offensive perspective. Yet no one is out there supporting them? That's wrong, and I wanted to fix it. Or at least play a small role, a small part, in doing so. So I just started making basically a booklet for myself. First, having those average attendance numbers, I thought there were some small and mid-majors like a Dayton that I wasn't going to ever be able to go to because they sell out every game. I'm not going to be able to get to the places that I need. I'll get into that in just a second um, to record great content. So I had about 10 mid-majors marked off. All the others seemed to be in play though. And then I made a daily atlas, or on an atlas, I made highlights of every single city where a game's being played. So I knew, okay, on Fridays or on Mondays when not many games are played, I need to be heading in that general direction so I can hit a game Friday, Monday, not ever, ever have to miss a single day. So once I had everything prepped, feel like I was as prepped as I was ever going to be, then it became time for the difficult conversations. My wife, my dad, my boss, talking it through with them. How is this going to work? Can I still keep my job while pursuing this to see if I'm having success in this? My boss, an incredible man, an incredible mentor, allowed that for at least three weeks. I had enough success, especially with the Barstool Yak opportunity, to where I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm garnering enough attention. There's enough excitement behind this that, yeah, I'm willing to take this risk. I'm willing to quit my job and pursue this full time or at least until the end of the conference regular season, until Selection Sunday, or at least up until the NCAA tournament. The last point I want to make, and I want to make this abundantly clear uh, as I conclude this intro before I jump into the top Cinderella's. I'm sorry if this intro has been long winded. I imagine it probably has. I'm not very good on this one on zero setting where I can just run with my thoughts. It's better if I probably, you know, get asked questions or are on other podcasts. But the main point uh, or the main thing that I've seen so far that, that's more than just basketball that I want to make clear to you is there is kindness everywhere. I think it's very easy to get wrapped up into the media or social media's trap where we see the ugliest sides of society at times. But there is kindness everywhere, especially if you're the one to initiate it. If you're the one to initiate it to someone else, people feel compelled to be kind back. I mean, even examples of like me going to East Tennessee State to record content um, of their campus, of their gym, of their student section, things like that. Even though I was cheering for Sanford. I was on the other side. I picked Sanford. I don't think East Tennessee State can be a Cinderella. Sanford, however, might. Yet East Tennessee State was so excited to get their school, their campus, their student section showcased that they wanted me there, hooked me up with a swag bag, treated me with the utmost kindness, um, gave me great seats right behind Sanford's bench. And that is just one small example. And it hasn't just even been the kindness that's been shown to me. I've watched others interact with one another, just being a bystander, right, that's observing it. There is kindness everywhere across the country in all parts of the U.S. Granted, I haven't been west on this journey, but I'm telling you people, there is kindness everywhere. And I hope we approach our daily lives with expecting there to be kindness and treating others with kindness rather than what the media or social media can do and have us look through life with a negative lens. I promise you there is so much positivity and kindness out there. I am witnessing it on a daily basis. Enough of the intro, enough of me rambling about that. I can stay a little bit more focused as I'm talking about individual teams here. Let's jump into the top Cinderella's on this journey, I'm gonna go through quite a few, but my number one Cinderella that I've seen so far, and this may be surprising 
Given that this isn't a top-tier mid-major league and this team's in third place of that not necessarily top-tier mid-major league, it's the Sun Belt and it's Marshall, it's the Thundering Herd. In taking notes for this podcast, I would mark down great individual performances that I saw. I never had to mark down more than two, I think, within each game. With Marshall, I marked down four. And it was all on the same team. The balance that they showed was tremendous. Andrew Taylor, Tavion Kinsey, and Camden Kerfman combined for 24 assists. That starting backcourt had 24 assists just between those three guys. Tavion Kinsey is absolutely a pro. 6'5", freak athlete, had 23 points, 7 assists. He's unselfish, can board, can score, can do it all as a two from the perimeter and attacking the bucket at a sick alley-oop in the game that I was at. Andrew Taylor, a little bit streaky, was to a nine from three in the game that I saw him. But at 19 points, nine boards, eight assists, the six foot three guard, talking about Tavion Kinsey doing a little bit of it all. Clearly Andrew Taylor can as well. Camden Kerfman, 17 points, nine assists, five of nine from three. And inside the seven one freshman, Micah, 17 points, 16 boards on eight of 10 from the floor. This is a Dan D'Antoni coach team. If you know anything about the D'Antonis, they know how to coach offense proof in Marshall's statistics. According to Shot Quality's data, they are second in high frequency pick and roll, 13th in good passing, 22nd in fewest turnovers, and 24th in tempo. This Marshall team, although they're third right now in the standings, they're one game behind Southern Miss, who they beat by 22 points in the game that I saw. I look for Marshall to win this conference, and because of what they can do offensively, how quick they can put the ball in the hole, this team can absolutely make a run in March and no one would want to draw them. Second, I'm going to go to the A-10. And I've got a slew of teams here, one of them being slew. But I'm going to go with the team that I think could be Cinderella the most. And although Dayton has been my favorite team with the experience that they gave me and I enjoy watching them, I've seen this team three times. Twice I bet against them. VCU. VCU is the team that I think is the best team in the A-10, and let me give you examples from just what I saw in the three games that I've seen them. So they're playing Dayton at Dayton. UD Arena sold out, 13,400 people, going absolutely nuts, hating Dayton. VCU gets down 33-17 late in the first half, scores a late bucket to make it a 14-point game going into halftime on the road. They're down seven going into the final four minutes. Again, raucous environment. VCU wins the game in regulation. This team, because of the defensive pressure that they can apply, can go on ridiculous runs by forcing you to turn over the basketball, and then they're great attacking the rim in transition. Proof of that. VCU, sixth in high free throw rate in the country, seventh in forcing turnovers in the country, and 29th in efficiency attacking the rim. That is a scary combination. This is all shot quality data. That is a scary combination when they can turn you over. They're great at driving and either getting to the line or finishing. On top of that, they've got David Shriver, who is a ridiculous shooter. I will see David Shriver in my nightmares from this Dayton game. I was on Dayton minus seven. He went six of eight from three, had 18 points. A guy that just does all the little things, get offensive boards, makes the nice nice pass, dives on the floor for loose balls, hits open threes, does all the little things for them to go along with their supreme athleticism of a Deloach, of a Nick Kern, of an Ace Baldwin. Brandon Johns is nice inside. This team is so scary because of what they do defensively. One of the best defensive mid-majors in the country turn you over, and then attack the rim. Even in the UMass game, they were down 33-31. Final score, VCU 83-55. to They won by 28 points. Beat them by 30 over the course of the last 24 minutes of that game. They went on a 15-0 run in the game I watched them at Richmond. Two of these three games were on the road. VCU can go on major runs because of what they do defensively in forcing you to turn the basketball over. Second in this conference that could make a run is Dayton. Dayton has a supreme level of talent. Deron Holmes watched him go for 32-6 and six at Fordham. Tamani Kamara watched him have a very solid, very efficient game at Fordham and then tear it up 
at home against VCU go for 27 and 11. They've got those two guys. They played without Kobe Elvis and Malachi Smith. I haven't even mentioned Mike Sheravajamets. I hope I'm saying that name right. His dad, Globetrotter, legend. Mike has his dad's skill set, ability. What his dad showed him the way, Mongolian Mike. Great shot. Unbelievable handle for a 6'9 point guard. Great vision. Still a freshman at times, but he absolutely will be a pro. This team, with Kobe Elvis and Malachi Smith healthy, has not been great. I believe they're going to figure it out before we get to Brooklyn, before we're in the A-10 tournament that second week of March. And this team has so much talent, the talent's eventually going to figure it out. That's my belief. Third, um, I watched them collapse to VCU, and I watched them hammer for them in the two games that I saw. Dayton, St. Louis, I've seen once. I'll see again tonight. Ridiculously impressed with what I saw offensively. Yuri Collins took two shots. Two shots from the floor of their starting point guard, who's averaging double-figure assists a game. Had 15 assists. It was beautiful, gorgeous, the passing display that I saw from Yuri Collins, Gibson Jimerson, a terrific shooter. Javante Perkins, I still don't think is healthy. He limps around the floor a lot, but obviously a supreme talent, smart, very good as well. The bigs, Okoro, Forrester, are problems inside. This team seems apathetic defensively, however. That's what has me staying away a little bit from this team or why I have them third. St. Joe's would drive, and they're just Olay defense. I can't tell you how many interior dunks they gave to St. Joe's, a team that's not going to be contending for an A-10 championship, let's be honest. I don't like the lack of concern on the defensive end of the floor, but love what this team can do offensively. You knew I wasn't going to go far with, before I get to this team. In the Patriot League, it's Colgate. It's Gate. I've seen these boys four times. I was fired up to watch them before I even began the journey. I've watched them over the last couple years with Ferguson, with Nellie Cummings. Um, Tucker Richardson has been great and still there. I, I wanted to watch this team because I was so excited to watch them offensively. The way they move the basketball, the unselfishness in which they play. I didn't think this team in the preseason would be as good as, pe as teams in years past. But Braden Smith has fixed that. I was worried about losing Nellie Cummings in that point guard play. Braden Smith is a six-foot freshman guard that has such an incredible feel for the game. When he needs to take over from a scoring perspective, shoot the outside shot to keep the defense honest, drive at the rim not just looking to pass but score enough, to keep the defense honest, and then facilitate ball movement. Tucker Richardson is basically a point guard playing the two. You have those two essentially point guards on the floor, and Jeff Woodward's a point forward. You go with shooters like Oliver Lynch Daniels, like Chandler Baker, like Ryan Moffat, a big inside like Keegan Records that can be a force for them at times. This team offensively is such a joy to watch. I have not seen more pure basketball than the 106-67 drumming that they put on Loyola, Maryland. It was so pure. Let me look at the numbers. They shot 67% from the floor. 67%. That's so difficult to do. 39 of 58. They went 14 of 23 from three. It was gorgeous. But it's not just what this team can do offensively. I'm not saying they're great defensively. It's their poise. It's their veteranness. It's Matt Lengel as a terrific basketball coach as to why this team's scary. I watched them give up a 20-0 run to Navy. Just not come out ready. Get down 20 to 2. Stay calm. Stay poised. Tie that game back up before it was even halftime. That's how quick their offense can operate. They end up winning by 14 points. Give up a 22-2 run. And win by 14 points? That's crazy. It was actually a 20-0 run at one point. Um, Army, I watched them be poised on the road. Get down 6 with 6.22 to go in the game. Execute perfectly down the stretch. Tie the game up. 15 seconds to go. Army has fouls to give. So Coach Langle so smartly goes early. Shout out my guy John for pointing that out to me. They get a bucket with 6 seconds left. Army's expecting him to hold for last shot. Just next level thinking, I absolutely love Gate. They can shoot the piss out of it. Number one three-point shooting team in the country. No one wants to see them in the NCAA tournament because of what they can do on the offensive end. Going to move a little bit quicker now in the American Memphis. 
not much of a Cinderella given, I mean, this team's been a one seed before, gone to the national title. Um, last year, they were an eight seed and were playing elite eight level basketball. I really believe that, excuse me, at the end of the year. But um, fell to Gonzaga in that great game. This seems frustrating to watch at times because offensively, boy, it can be ugly. At one point, they and Temple had attempted combined over 43s and were shooting less than 10% from three. There, there hasn't been much of a tougher watch than those first 34 minutes of this game, Memphis Temple, in all 39 games that I've seen. However, after that, they get down nine. 36-45, they start to trap, press, speed Temple up, force some turnovers, which Memphis is unbelievable at. Um, also, they force you into bad three-point shots, given the percentage of Temple and Memphis. They're 13th in good defense against three-point percentage, 8th in tempo. When they were able to speed Temple up, they were finally able to start playing their game, put the ball in the hole, and then Kendrick Davis is a superstar. He just took over late, had, I want to say, 14 points in those last eight minutes after really struggling in the first 32. DeAndre Williams, a 6'9 senior forward, had 20 points, nine boards. That is a scary duo right there. Their ability to turn you over, similar to a VCU, play a quick style when they've got you turned over and they're getting in transition, they're doing just what they want. People don't want to see Memphis, I don't think, in the tournament because of their defensive capabilities. Moving on now to the SoCon. I've got number one here, UNC Greensboro. UNC Greensboro, I've seen twice. They beat Western Carolina by 25 points, and then they beat Mercer by 11. We're tied late in that one and went on a big time late run. UNC Greensboro has given up combined 95 points in two games. 80 minutes of basketball, they've given up 95 points when I've watched them play. I gotta credit Coach Mike Jones and this staff. The entire staff, the entire bench is unified together, always chanting, always providing positivity, even if they've given up a run. They're on to the next play. And you see that mentality affect their play. I've seen it now in two games. Even when they got you know tied, they give up that big run to Mercer. They call timeout, they get unified together, positive, go back out in the game, specifically Michael Brown-Jones took over late. They take over the end of that basketball game and get a win. UNC Greensboro is elite on the defensive end of the floor. That is their calling card. They also have brothers playing together, the Langley brothers, which I think should be illegal. At times on the floor, they have telepathy together. It should be illegal to be brothers and go to the same school that's just an unfair advantage. I already mentioned MBJ, his dominance. Um, Keandre Kennedy is probably the best guard on this team, can just create his own shot late in the shot clock when they need it. UNC Greensboro, their unity, their togetherness, the leadership of Mike Jones is why I think this team will win this conference in defense over three straight games in Asheville, I think, is where that tournament's held. I look for that to win out for Greensboro. But second is a team that kind of plays an exact opposite style, Furman. They focus on the offensive end of the floor, and boy, do they do a great job of it. I watched them at Wofford have terrible starts to the first half and second half. Give up 8-0 in 9-0 runs. Didn't score a single point by the first TV timeout. By the third TV timeout, they already had 29 points. They scored 96 in this game with four-minute dry spells in each half to start the half and put up 96 points. This team is terrific offensively. Jalen Slauson, maybe it's because he just looks like him, reminds me so much of Jeremiah Robinson Earl. Can shoot enough from the perimeter that you have to respect it, but wants to lift take you baseline, take you inside, and use his, his athleticism. Got a nice spin move, turnaround, little baby hook as well. Very versatile. Defensively, he's a problem. Also, if you don't get him in foul trouble, Mike Bothwell, great scoring guard, averages nearly 20 points a game. But it was a little bit the role, guys, when I watched them. Alex Williams had 18 points. If he's able to do anything close to that throughout the rest of the season, and this team has four offensive weapons, they're going to be nuts, and I'll get into JP, their point guard, his performance a little bit later on, but it was exceptional. This offense is scary, and in March, they could just flat out outscore a team if they're shooting well from the perimeter. 
Furman is 16th in the country in high frequency three point percentage. If I'm a four seed, if I'm a five seed, I'm not wanting to see an offense like that that shoots the three ball that much. If they're just hot that night, even if we're playing good defense, we still might get beat. They're also 17th in good passing. Look out for Furman. I'll be a little bit briefer about Sanford. I think it's an incredible story. I think it's an awesome run. Bucky McMillan in his first year, they won just six games at Sanford. Then they start the uh, SoCon season, I want to say 8-0 in conference play. Just unbelievable, the turnaround that they've had. Logan Dye is a physical presence inside that loves to be physical. He wants to bang around with you inside um, and score on in the interior, but also shoots it well enough that you got to respect him from the perimeter. They didn't have Quez Glover healthy in this game. He's a 19-point-per-game guy last year. Small guard can create a lot for them, not just for himself, but for others. Jermaine Marshall had a terrific game when I saw him. 18 points, 12 boards, 3 of 5 from 3, a 6-6 forward. This Sanford team is my third team in the SOCOM, but all three are problems. All three could win a game, perhaps multiple, in the NCAA tournament. I really believe that. Sanford, 18th in the country in high-frequency three-point percentage, similar to Furman. They love shooting the three ball. Next, I'm going to the Missouri Valley. I've only seen one game in the Missouri Valley. I plan on seeing more in late February, but Bradley. The Bradley Braves, even though they lost in this game, they dominated it for 30 couple minutes, 30, 32 minutes. And then Bradley, Drew Freiburg just got red hot. Ben Shepard got some confidence late. They went on a run at home to close this one out, but it's the defense. When you don't have to score many points to win basketball games, I like your chances, and that's what Bradley does. According to Kim Palm, they're 68th defensively. From what I saw, they were much better than that. They are stifling. Um, Belmont seemed really reliant on Ben Shepard to make something happen. Drew started clicking at the right time, as I mentioned. I don't trust, despite Bradley being tied first right now at 9-3, and three, or excuse me, Belmont, I don't trust them long-term. Bradley, even though they're tied third, eight and four, I trust them much more long-term. I think it's either Bradley or Drake, granted I haven't seen much of Southern Illinois, need to watch them some, that I think will win this conference, but Drake just ridiculously inconsistent. I think Bradley, their calling card being defense, will win out long-term. Another conference, the MAC. I've got two candidates here. I think I would put Akron above Kent State in the games that I saw, but I only saw one half of Kent State, important to note. So when I got there, they were up 42 to 31. It was a doubleheader. I was just in Cleveland before that. They were up 42 31 on Buffalo. It seemed like they knew Kent State's 24th in, in the country um, in defensive efficiency, according to Kim Pomp. I didn't see that on display in the second half against Buffalo, but. They were up that whole second half until the very end when Buffalo made a run the last two minutes that was essentially meaningless except for the spread. Kent State didn't seem to be too committed on the defensive end of the floor, but sometimes that's just a team knowing they're about to get a home win and being a little lackadaisical late, so I'm not going to penalize them too much for that. Sincere Carey was terrific in what I watched. 24 points, 7 assists. Didn't shoot it well from the perimeter, but was incredible at his ability to double clutch inside and find a way to finish amongst the trees, amongst the bigs, a unique creator and finisher around the basket. Also had seven assists, does a great job creating for others. This Kent State team, one to watch out for. Akron, why I like them a little bit more. Granted, I was able to watch a full game of them, but they've got the inside out. Enrique Freeman is a problem on the interior. You better block that man out, and it still may not be enough. He's a double-double machine that went for 32-15 and 15 on an efficient 14 of 18 from the floor. When I watched him, he may want to foul him. He missed some free throws late. But boy, is he a presence on the interior. And then when you have a 20-point-per-game guy in Xavier Castaneda, he didn't have a great shooting night when I saw him. Uh, but they also got Trendon, who's another good shooter, this team has an inside out to them with Freeman inside that if I'm a power six team, I'm not wanting to face because I may not have the best big. Xavier Freeman may be the best big on the court and he may not even be their best player with Xavier being such a, a great scorer 
from the outside, Akron, another team, I know I'm saying this often about every team, and I'm going to be mid and small major bias, but another team, I'm not necessarily chomping at the bit to see in the NCAA tournament, and they almost beat, almost beat UCLA when they were a 13 seed last year, making the NCAA tournament. Can the Zips do it again? In the Colonial, I know about Charleston's great run. I'm not living under a rock. But Towson, look out for this team. I want Charleston to keep on winning. I want Charleston to win every game so they can make it as an at-large. And we see Towson get the automatic bid when they knock them off in D.C. in the title. Towson, I've watched them three times. They are so balanced. Cam Holden is a threat to get a triple-double every time he's out there on the floor. He loves to post you up despite being just 6'6", and then he's so versatile from there. Has a unique baby hook that he loves to use, and then he has such great vision from posting up, whether it's hitting Charles inside, who's a force who just loves to work, stay around the boards, get rebounds, get putbacks. Nick Timberlake, who is the biggest microwave that I have seen in all 39 games. He just has to see one. When he sees one, he thinks he is red hot, and he probably is. He probably is. Ryan Conway, Nigel Russell, great perimeter pieces. Uh, Siku Silla, the number one or the um, D2 National Player of the Year last year, is a role guy for this team. They got off to not a great start, but this team's starting to click at the right time. They're not a team you want to see in March. Trust me, I love Pat Scary. I love these Towson Tigers. Iona. I know they've struggled of late. It was really cool to watch Rick Pitino. He's very Saban-esque. Um, but boy, did I see a performance from the Gales when I watched them. They destroyed Maris start to finish, 84-57. to It was never really close. Dennis Jenkins, it says in my stats that he went 10 of 18 from the floor. I don't remember him missing more than two shots. Top-notch junior college transfer that Patino was able to get in. Had 23 points, 10 assists, and 5 rebounds. Nelly Jr. Joseph, he's a force inside. 19 points, 12 boards. They didn't have Clayton healthy. They didn't have Quinn Solansky healthy. I think that's part of the inconsistency. If they're a ever able to get fully healthy and cohesive by the time they get to March, I still think this is the MAAC's best chance and that they will win the MAAC when it comes to the conference tournament in Atlantic City. Iona, you know Patino's a great coach, won a national championship before. I don't think you're wanting to see them either. My last conference that I'll discuss and a couple teams in it is the America East. This has been a very balanced league. Vermont leading it at six and two. Eighth place though, just three and five. Vermont, although they've had a couple not so great losses, they're still a very veteran team. Seven of their top eight contributors, I want to say, are seniors. Dylan Penn provides an interesting look for him. Jalen Brunson-esque in that he's a small guard but loves to go down and post up. Has a baby hook. Came holding a little bit bigger. But similar to what I was describing, he went for 19-9 and on 8-12 to from the floor. And at times would post up. They'd bring a double kick out to Finn Sullivan or someone like it, Rob Duncan, also an incredible passer on this team. I saw a very good performance from this Vermont team. They beat UMBC by 13 points, and I don't think UMBC is particularly a slouch. They can shoot it well from the perimeter. I like this Vermont team. Do I think that they can pull off an upset? I'd be surprised, but they do have the veteranness to them. Um, and they do play very well together, move the basketball well together. Bryant, how this team is 4-4 four and four in the America East with as good a coach as Coach Grasso is, I have no idea. They have power six talent on the floor, supreme athleticism in an Antoine Walker, in an Earl Timberlake, great guards in Charlie Pride, in Gross Bullock. Between those four weapons alone, I think that would be enough to win the America East, yet they're 500. And you'll be looking at, they play a ridiculously fast tempo. You'll be looking up, you know, when you're looking at scores at some point, and they'll be down 20 at half at times. I hope they get it together. I think with Coach Grasso, they will. But I think from a talent perspective, there's no doubt this is the AE's best representative, but they can't seem to get it together to this point. 
So that is my list of Cinderella's that I've seen over the course of five weeks. I wanted that to be kind of the main focus of the podcast. Next, I'm going to get into individual performances. First team, I've got three teams listed in all of them. I tried to do three guards and two bigs, but wow, have I seen some sensational performances. As I said in the intro, I've seen great individual players like an Imani Bates, like an Antoine Davis, not have great showings. So this is not the top players. This is best individual performances. First team, I've got under six foot guard, Philip Russell. He would be MVP. He would be MVP if I were to rank every performance I've seen in 39 games. Simo, sophomore guard, 37 points, six assists on 11 of 20 from the floor and five of nine from three. We'll get into Simo when I get into bad beats, but he took over and ruined my Moorhead State pick. He absolutely took over and dominated that game. Dennis Jenkins, I mentioned him already from Iona. 23 points, 10 assists, 5 rebounds. I love when a guard is able to score and pass, affect the game in both ways, know when they're drawing two, and make the right look to a teammate. I love watching that. He went 10 of 18 from the floor, 3 of 6 from 3. Was so good at the mid-range. A lost art. He was phenomenal in what I watched. Jordan Dingle, I've now watched him twice. He had a terrible performance at home, I'm going to be honest. But on the road at Columbia, 33 points, 7 boards, 11 to 17 from the floor, 7 to 9 from 3. From what I saw in that game, absolutely. He's a pro. 6 foot 3, but very thick. Does a great job being physical in once he gets to his spots and creating separation. Very impressed with Jordan Dingle first time around, not as much second time around, but still think the guy could be a pro. My guy JP at Southern Indiana, Jacob Polokovic, six foot nine, senior forward. I'm going to make a prediction. It's not going to be Oscar Shibway. This man will end the year number one in the country in rebounds. I watched him put up 20 points and 24 boards. The guy just has a knack for finding the basketball when it's coming off the rim, knowing where it's going to be before anyone else on the floor does. Simply a workhorse. Another workhorse that I've already mentioned to round out the first team, Xavier Freeman from Akron, six foot seven junior forward, plays so much bigger than that. 32 points and 15 rebounds on 14 of 18 from the floor. Another guy that just flat out works. Now for the top players on the second team. Speaking of a guy that plays a lot bigger than he's listed, Damian Chong Kui out of Purdue Fort Wayne. If you remember that name, the 5'8 guard, he was at Mount St. Mary's, helped lead them to an NCAA tournament. He's now at Purdue Fort Wayne. Averages less than 10 points a game, but didn't the night I saw him 31 points, two boards, two assists on 13 to 25 from the floor and three of eight from three. PFW didn't seem to be woken up. They didn't seem prepared, ready to play. They got down 16 to six and he was like, hey guys, get on my back. I'm going to will us to being in this game and gave them an opportunity to win it. He was exceptional. Shooting the ball from the three or lift would then drive and at 5'8", able to finish amongst the trees. You better be ridiculously creative. And he was in the showing that I saw. Cam Woods, another guard on the second team, six foot two, sophomore guard out of North Carolina A&T. 29 points and six boards on nine of 18 from the floor and five of 10 from three. Good luck guarding this man. He is so quick with the dribble, so shifty, can create separation seemingly at will whenever he wants to, and and knock down contested threes. 29 points on 5 of 10 from 3, and everyone on the court knows he's NCA and T's best player, and you better stick with him. Yet Towson still couldn't stop him, particularly in the first half, did a much better job in the second half. Cam Woods, unbelievable. Daryl Banks of St. Bonaventure cost me an L when I was on George Mason. Don't bet against the Bonnies in the Riley Center. I learned the hard way. Daryl Banks, 27 points, four boards, eight of 14 from the floor, six, 11 from three. Not, you know, an incredible stat line necessarily compared to what other guys have done where they are more versatile rebounds, assist, but why I selected Daryl Banks. He hit every big shot for the Bonnies. In the first half, it looks like George Mason was simply too talented, too veteran for St. Bonaventure. And then Daryl Banks just sparks George or sparks the Bonnies with a couple threes. Dagger in the foot of George Mason. Late in that game, 
George Mason looking to close it out, looking to come back. The young St. Bonaventure team looking like they're going to hand it to the Patriots. Daryl Banks says not so fast. Takes over late, knocks down free throws, knocks down big threes. 27 massive points for the Bonnies in a win. The two forwards, both from Dayton. I've got Tumani Kamara and Deron Holmes on my second team. Deron didn't have as good a game against VCU at home, but 32-6 and six on 12 of 15 from the floor when I watched him at Fordham. Ergo didn't bring the double. Massive mistake. They've since won five straight. Clearly, Ergo knows what he's doing. Should have brought the double against Dayton. Deron Holmes made them pay. Tamani Kamara had 15-8 and eight against Fordham on 6-9 and nine from the floor, but 27-11 and 11 came out ready to go from the jump in that home game against VCU. Ultimately wasn't enough. But 10-16 from the floor, 1-2 from 3. Both my bigs on the second team from Dayton. Top players on the third team. This is a guy, you'll see big scores in every performance except this one. Only three points. I'd already mentioned this performance. Yuri Collins, three points, took two shots from the floor. One of two. Yet had 15 assists in seven rebounds. The way he facilitates, the way he sees lanes that no one else, not just on the court, but in the country does, is incredible to watch on display live and in person. I can't wait to watch him again tonight in Rose Hill Gymnasium. Yuri Collins is special. He is a special passer, ball handler, has incredible vision. Second, I'm going with JP Peegs out of Furman. I don't know if I'm saying his last name right, but six foot one, sophomore guard, very athletic. And had I not known what Mike Bothwell averaged, what Jalen Slauson averaged going in, I would have thought JP was the best player on this team. 26 points, 8 boards, 4 assists. Definitely wasn't hunting his shot at all. Was much more hunting to facilitate. But took the open look when he had it or when Furman needed a bucket. I loved his poise, his composure. 8 of 17 from the floor, 4 of 9 from 3. Very impressed with this sophomore guard. My third guard, last guard on the third team, Andrew Taylor. Out of Marshall, the six foot three junior guard had 19 points, nine boards, eight assists. It's simply the versatility as to why I had him there. Didn't shoot it great from the three that night, two of nine, yet didn't let that impact his overall game. Was able to drive, finish some tough baskets inside, rebound very well, and of course facilitate offense very well in the great movement, unselfish movement that this Marshall team and Dan D'Antoni coaches with and they play with. Inside my two bigs on the third team, Tosan Evbuwoman. I don't know, I, I probably butchered his name, but the 6'8 senior forward from England out of Princeton, 26 points, seven boards, three assists. Penn had no answer for him, particularly in the second half. It was a one point game at halftime, and then Princeton ran away because Tosan did. 26 points, seven boards, nine of 13 from the floor, one of two from three. In the Ivy League, he's a presence on the inside. And then another Marshall player will round out my top three teams. Micah Hanlogden out of Marshall, seven foot one freshman, 17 points, 16 boards, almost all of it in the second half. He dominated the second half, took the life out of Southern Miss, created extra possessions, seven foot one. You, some teams won't have an answer for that just out of sheer size, especially in the Sun Belt. He's a problem on the interior with the great guards that Marshall has want to quickly run through some honorable mentions that, that don't make the, the top three teams. Tavion Kinsey, perhaps you've heard of him, 23.7 assists. Sincere Carey, 24.7 assists. Jalen Rucker went for over 20 points in five boards or assists. And both times that I saw him hit three or more threes on low volume both times I saw him easily could have made the list. Several double-double performances that didn't make the list. Mark Freeman at Moorhead. Watched him drop 26 in a loss, but he passed 1,000 points scoring all time on his career. He can put the ball in the hole. Josh Cohen probably is the best player in the NEC. Had 27.7 boards for St. Francis, Pennsylvania. The Jalens at Tulane are special. Cook and Forbes 
Wow, is that team fun to watch offensively. Michael Brown-Jones at UNCG. I mentioned him earlier when talking about Greensboro. Dominated that late game against Mercer. Both times I saw him was a great score on low volume. Kendrick Davis at Memphis, his clutch gene. Dylan Penn at Vermont was tough. Braden Smith of Colgate and Jackson Pavletsky at Wofford are unbelievable as freshmen. You give those guys four years, watch what they'll do as seniors. Those will be names that you'll remember. Braden Smith of Colgate, Jackson Pavleski at Wofford. Terrific players. I've seen some incredible performances. I have seen some incredible performances, to say the least, in 39 games and can't wait to watch more. But moving on now from incredible individual performances to the top coaches that I've enjoyed watching. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Not every game I'm able to get to where I need to. Not every game I'm right behind the bench. When I am right behind the bench, obviously I can get a feel of the coach much more than when I'm in a student section or when I'm in on, on the opposite side. But my favorite coach, a man I would dive in front of a bus for if he was about to walk in front of it, Pat Scary out of Towson. This guy, absolutely hysterical. Absolutely hysterical. Makes me crack up the entire time I'm watching Towson play. Think Northeast Small College Bobby Knight. This guy is Northeast as it gets. Maybe not as demonstrative as Bobby Knight was, but this guy just wants to win, and it's so clear. And the funniest part about him is he can go from absolutely freaking out to then be very calm in a flip of a switch and kind of knows what his team needs when they need it. I love Pat Scary. I love this man. Second, Mike Jones, UNC Greensboro. I'm going to discuss his Twitter bio for a second. His Twitter bio is believer, servant, teammate. His entire bench, I just got goosebumps saying it. His entire bench and his entire team plays that way as servants, as teammates. They are all there for one another to pick one another up. There is no doubt he dictates that from the top down. I love when I see a staff that is cohesive together and that everyone's opinion on that staff matters. Coach is going to have the insight. But everyone has a role that they're playing on the staff, and it is so evident and clear with this UNCG team. It's my second favorite coach. Third, I got to go to Colgate, Matt Langle. Offensively, guy is just a mastermind. The way he gets in the mood, the basketball, cut, move without the basketball. He's an offensive genius, clearly. He is very calm, very poised. I watched them get down 20 to 2 against Navy. I watched them. I'm right behind the bench against Army, hearing every word of the timeouts when they're down six with 622 to go. Very poised, such a believer in his team, offensive genius. Matt Langle, third favorite coach. Fourth, Bryant, Jared Grasso. I've already talked about him. Has unbelievable talent at Bryant. I mentioned those four guys. I didn't even mention Doug Eater, who is a role guy for him. They have such talent that I think Coach Grasso is going to figure it out. This team very well could win the AES tournament, but the head bobs. I can't get enough of how much this guy head bobs. He simply brings energy. He simply brings energy. The head bobs get me going. I'm all about Coach Grasso. I'm all about watching their fast tempo, the way and the style in which he plays. Love Coach Grasso, my fourth favorite coach. Fifth, I got to go Bucky McMillan. I was able to talk to Coach McMillan afterwards. A manager pulled me over and was like, hey, Coleman was at this game. We got to get him at a home game. Talked to him, congratulated him on his turnaround. Six wins two years ago to the team that we're seeing at Sanford. This isn't normal Sanford basketball. Coach McMillan is turning this program around. I, you know, when you're a kid, maybe some of you don't have this experience. I'm saying it like all of you do, but... For myself, playing dynasty modes as a kid growing up, you dream of being that coach. To go to a program that you take them over after somebody just got fired and they're doing terrible, and you turn them around and make them relevant and then work your way up from there, or maybe you develop a dominant mid-major force at that program. Bucky McMillan's doing that in real life. That is so neat. Um, some honorable mention to Lane, Ron Hunter. Boy, is that guy animated. I love watching his reactions on the sidelines, and obviously he knows how to coach them offense. They play an incredible quick tempo at Tulane. Vermont, John Becker, he is hysterical. Absolutely hysterical. I love John. Clearly a great coach. What he's developed in Burlington, Vermont, has dominated the A East. They've run it. Army, Jimmy Allen. Great coach. Maybe the best team in Army program history, at least since Coach K has been there. 
Love Jimmy Allen, the way he coaches. Dan D'Antoni at Marshall. Electric offense. Guy knows offense, no doubt about it. And Rick Bettino at Iona. I mentioned it before, but he's Saban-esque. They beat Maris by 27. They were dominating that entire way, and the guy never seems to crack a smile, never seems satisfied. I love that never satisfied mentality. Maybe crack a smile a little bit more often, coach. But I love that we're always looking for better. We aren't playing for right now to beat Maris by 27 in Poughkeepsie. We're playing for Atlantic City. We're playing for the NCAA tournament. That's what they're prepping for, and he expects perfection throughout. Joy to watch that legend coach. So there are 10 coaches right there, my top five, and then some honorable mentions that I ran through. Again, I'm not able to see everybody up close and personal like I have been with some coaches. And then I'm obviously not able to see kind of the other team, the team that I'm betting against very much if I'm sitting behind one team's bench. So makes it difficult, but those are the coaches that I've enjoyed the most. Top venues. Number one. Dayton, UD Arena, and it's not going to be top. A few of these venues, Dayton, VCU, Richmond, Wichita State, I never thought I was going to be able to go to. I thought they sell out or get close to it too much that I'm not going to be able to sit where I need to. Shout out those people that were able to hook me up at those games. Again, just people being kind for no reason other than to be kind. I appreciate the absolute hell out of it. It's given me incredible experiences that I didn't think I was going to be able to partake in. Dayton, UD Arena, 13,407. They sell it every game. There's a reason the first four games are played there. That city just loves their basketball. And I respect the hell out of a city that just loves their basketball. Dayton, no doubt that. I sat in the student section. They're standing, fired up, yelling the entire game top experience and I don't see it being topped. I, I don't see there being a better experience in mid and small major basketball. I forgot. I did go to a Duke game. I'm not going to talk about that. Cameron is number one. Emotional. I was emotional walking in, seeing, you know, um, the shrines that they have dedicated towards their national championship teams, towards their retired players, towards Coach K himself. I grew up a Duke fan Thank God I kind of changed out of it. Don't really like them as much anymore. But still, that place has an aura to it. That place is special. That place is obviously number one, but I'm excluding Duke. That was an exception. I, I couldn't pass up on that opportunity that I was given. I appreciate it so much. I was emotional in that arena. It's that special. I'm telling you what. But number two, moving on, VCU, the Siegel Center. 7,000 people in attendance nearly sold out that's a special arena shout out that band best band that i've seen by far shout out the main guy that conducts it the band conductor he's an electric factory loved watching a game in the seagull center boy did they put on a show in front of their home fans and that place got loud third north carolina a t the corbett sports center 5700 was a sold out environment Wow, was that special. Wow, was that unique. Honestly, a culturing experience for me to be able to watch a game at an HBCU, see the support that they had. I wish there was that level of support at every HBCU. Please continue to show out North Carolina a and I promise you those players support it. God, it was so fun in a loud environment. I haven't had more fun at a game for all two hours than at North Carolina a and Every TV timeout in the entirety of halftime is one big party. Everybody up, dancing, rapping to the lyrics of whatever's being played was so special to get to be a part of. I, I am forever thankful for that experience. I hope my gratitude doesn't get like lost on people or I'm saying it about so much that it's not like, oh, this guy doesn't mean it. No, I've just had so many incredible experiences that I'm thankful for. And North Carolina A&T is damn near up at the top of that list. I haven't had more fun throughout the entire two hours I was in a basketball arena than at NC A&T. But I got to rank it third because of Dayton, because of VCU, that those teams, you know, dominated the majority of their games, even though Dayton didn't win their game, that it was just a louder environment throughout. But in terms of the TV timeouts, the halftime, North Carolina INT was the most fun. At number four, I've got Marshall. This was nowhere close to sold out. Marshall, get out and support a little bit more. But those of you that did, it was loud as hell. 4,000 people in that 9,000 person arena. 
but it was extremely loud. When everybody's chanting back and forth, we are Marshall, we are Marshall. I mean, guy, you can't beat that. Absolutely sick. That was a awesome time in the Cam Henderson Center, and they put on a show, 22-point beatdown of Southern Miss. Number five, I'm going with the Robbins Center. 7K, nearly sold out. At times, it would get very loud when Wichman was on a run, but VCU dominated that game so much that the Robbins Center was silent too often for me to rank it higher, but a sold-out venue that I wouldn't have been able to get into without a very nice ticket lady, me just explaining my story and her giving me a ticket, wasn't able to get to where I wanted to be, so that was a little bit of a unique experience. I stood for the second half of the game, just kind of in the corner of the arena. Um, but Robin Center, ridiculously nice arena. Very, very nice arena. Just would like it a little bit more louder, and maybe that's just because they weren't scoring very much VCU playing stifling defense. At number six, Wichita State, the Charles Coach Arena, which I've heard since Greg Marshall has been gone. Granted, they haven't had as much success, but there hasn't been as much support, which I hate that. Round Ball Arena, so cool, just the round uh, dome-esque feel, I guess. The outside, my wife made a comment she was at that game that she felt like she was at a Thunder game, the concourse. So, so nice. Um, wish it would get a little bit louder in support of Wichita State, but still did, still absolutely did. When they got up 18, that place was rocking, but I would like to see that place sold out consistently like it used to be. Wichita loves their basketball. Get back out and support them like you were. At number seven, I have St. Bonaventure, the Riley Center. Now, some of these venues, places that I've gone, were while the kids were gone at Christmas break. That was the case with St. Bonaventure, so it's not going to be loud as loud without a student section there but still very old arena you can just look around and see the tradition see all the local fans it's a tiny town St. Bonaventure a tiny town but boy do they come out and support their basketball I love seeing that number seven is St. Bonaventure number eight I've got Penn the Palestra it was about half attended, 4,000 out of 8,000. I'm going to be honest, I thought there were more there. The second oldest venue in all of college basketball, the reason I've got it at eight, the, the tradition, the history there is so cool, so special. But because that arena was constructed in 1925, it's hard to get to where you need to go. And maybe it's just because it's an Ivy League game, but they've got that place staffed up like it's Fort Knox. Don't let you get to where you need to be unless it's your seat. So because of that, I was only able to purchase a general admission ticket, not able to get to where I needed to go. So that gave me a little bit more of a negative experience. But you need to get there at some point. Wish the A-10 tournament was still there. Can't imagine how special that was when it was there. So, so cool. The Palestra, very old unique venue, but because it's built in 1925, kind of hard to get around in that place. Another old venue, Rose Hill Gymnasium, where I will be tonight. I have ninth, the fourth oldest arena in all of college basketball, Penn since 1925, Fordham since 1927. Those old venues, just the history of walking into them, there's a special feel to them. And I've heard Rose Hill Gymnasium can get very loud, when you're down 22-4 to four early and are never really able, able to overcome it against Dayton, it didn't get that loud. But Coach Ergo's got that team clicking. Four straight wins. They haven't had a winning conference record since 2007. Could that change this year? Maybe there will be a little bit more support out there tonight. At number 10, I've got Southern Indiana Screaming Eagles Arena. Very, very nice arena. New modern, looks sick on the outside. Um, they've got great support. 2,100 people were there. Southern Indiana, it, as long as there's no, you know, big competitor that comes in within the next four years. In four years, Southern Indiana is going to be dominating the Ohio Valley Conference. They've got a bit of an unfair advantage getting that conference tournament there in Evansville, but they will be dominating that conference because of that facility and because of having the conference tournament in the Ohio Valley, now that Murray State Belmont's gone, look for Southern Indiana to run this conference going forward. Wish they'd have a chance to get to make the NCAA tournament this year. Very nice arena, Screaming Eagles Arena. 
the worst venues. People wanted me to mention those. Number one, Wagner. Looks like a rec league gym. Looks like your third grade nephew is about to be coming out to tip it off for the 3 o'clock Saturday afternoon game. Oh, wait, no. Wagner's coming out to play a Division I basketball team that might win the NEC, that might be in the NCAA tournament. That's kind of nuts to me. Um, it seats 2,100. There were less than 500 people there. On the opposite end, I don't even know if people were allowed to sit there, but there's like three bleachers, a row of like three rows of bleachers. Everything is just road bleachers. That was the worst venue that I've been into on Staten Island. Number two, you're going to hear a lot of Patriot League schools here. They, they just seem to not care about their basketball that much. Maybe they're more worried about the books or people in the Northeast just have better things to do. But Loyola, Maryland. There are no gyms on either, or excuse me, no bleachers on either end or seats. So it is a shooter's gym if there ever was one, only seating up the sides, um, but a very old arena. I would say that was the second worst. I'm combining when I'm talking about best and worst. It's not just nicest venue, nicest arena, right? I'm combining environment with it as well. 700 people there, they got beat by 34. Um, not, not very nice. Bryant, third. This is similar to Lola, Maryland, where it's a shooter's gym. There's a little bit more of an extension. It's not just straight wall, kind of like it is at Loyola, Maryland. But Bryant's gym, why I had it a little above Loyola, Maryland, is it is newer. Seats 2,600 people. There are only 700 there. I went during break. Would like to go when there are more students. I feel like that place could maybe get pretty loud. But in my experience, and they got beat by UMBC at home, didn't have a great experience. Third. Bryant, number four is Colgate. There were 600 people there. It seats 2,100. It is very, very old. If they had a bad team and didn't get support, it would be number one on the list. But the oldness, the uniqueness to it, along with that they're a good team, so they have some decent support even with kids on break. If they were a bad basketball team, I would imagine there would have been 150 people at that game that night. So... Colgate could be higher up this list if not for having a good basketball team that it makes the venue a little bit more unique and let me tell you something you're driving up into the middle of nowhere when you're going into Hamilton New York you will not believe if you're coming from the south you will not believe that you are about to be coming up on a college campus until you're a quarter mile from it you'll see a hospital but before then it's just fields it is just fields you'll think you're in Oklahoma crazy experience driving out there number five Lafayette there's a big track around the court, and one end of the court has bleachers that are on that track. Gives it a weird feel. It is a kind of nice venue when you walk into it, but just an odd feel, kind of playing in between that indoor track. It says there are 1,500 people there for the game I watched them play Army. There's no way. There's no way. They're bumping up those numbers. Um, kind of an odd environment to it. Honorable mention, Coppin State. It's a nice gym. But no support, less than a thousand people there. I mean, they listed 791. There's no way there were 791 people at that game. Lehigh also could have made this list. Bigger arena, very old, um, but not a ton of support and, and got some old features to it. Those are my list of worst venues. A lot of Patriot League schools in there. A lot of schools in the Northeast in there. Northeast doesn't seem to care as much about their college ball as other parts of the country, the Carolinas, um, the, the Midwest. Okay, I was going to include a segment of um, worst bad beats or best close wins, something like that. But I feel like this podcast has gone on long enough. I will include that in the second podcast that I'm going to be releasing. I'll be, re I'll be recording that Friday, so probably releasing it Saturday. But this podcast, excluding the bad beats segment and the close wins is going to be largely bracketology oriented. So I'll be discussing a little bit more of, of the college landscape, college basketball landscape as a whole. I'll also be talking about the teams that I believe will end up come into or come mid-March will be seated higher than where I have them right now. Look for them to play better ball to end the season. And then teams that will be seated lower or might miss the tournament altogether. But I'm looking forward to recording that one. Hope you're looking forward to listening to it. Hope I showcase that I know a little bit of what I'm talking about when it comes to college basketball. And I hope you enjoyed listening to specific pieces of the journey. If you all have things that you want to hear that you haven't heard me discuss, please. I need ideas of the content that you all want 
to be shown. I will do my best to accommodate when there's something that everyone wants to see. Um, so please give me suggestions, give me ideas. I enjoyed recapping my journey to this point, excited for what's going to happen in this next month and a half. Um, in this next month and a half, my plan, I may not be going to a game every single day. Now, I may have to miss the occasional Monday, the occasional Friday. I'm going to prioritize rather than going to a game every single day, going to bigger games. So I haven't seen much of the Sun Belt, none of the Conference USA, none of the Atlantic Sun. Um, so some of these conferences that I've only been to one game, only one game in the Missouri Valley. I want to go to more of, and I want to go to their biggest games, right? Where the top teams in the conference are playing one another. Now, at my size, my following has grown a lot more since the beginning of this journey, so it makes it a little bit easier for me to get hookups into these games that are already sold out or uh, get the seat that I need. So please continue to help in doing that. It makes my job so much easier. I cannot thank you enough, those that have. But I'm going to not be going to a game every single day. Going to do the best of what I can going forward. But we'll be focusing on trying to go to the biggest games. Ones that you all want to see. Ones that are teams that could be in the NCAA tournament. Lastly, what to look forward to in the conference tournament. I've already got my schedule lined out from the 3rd through the 12th. I already have an idea of what I'm going to do to see as many games as possible. I think just from the 3rd to the 12th, I've got 24 games lined out in those 10 days, right? So going to be seeing some quarterfinal action of some of the tournaments. Going to be seeing six or seven conference championship games, teams punching their ticket. Stay tuned for that content. That's going to be 24 games, right, from the 3rd to the 12th that I am recording teams ending their seasons players ending their careers, other, others surviving and advancing for one more day, others punching their ticket to something they've dreamed of their whole life, the big dance. They get their chance. I cannot wait for this next month and then that special month that's to follow. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Your support means more than you would ever know the kind words that you lovely people consistently give. My biggest takeaway from this is not basketball. As much as I'm loving finding Cinderella before the ball, I want the biggest takeaway to be how kind and nice people are across this entire country. Start treating everyone you meet with kindness, and I promise you they will feel compelled to give it back. I've watched it take place all over the country. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day. I'm going to try to have a great rest of this journey. Let's find Cinderella together.